Good morning. This is the last lecture of QBI, and um, now we will actually le leave the analysis topics, but more look into how to handle the data. So it's about scaling up uh, the analysis uh, computationally, and also looking into some big data topics. And um, There is some um, literature as always. Um, now we don't have any single processing, image processing books or papers around here. As you can see, it's a lot of uh, cluster computing. Um, also a paper I just found uh, this one, the real cost of a CPU hour, actually using large scale computing costs something. And this paper makes a comparison between uh, different uh, approaches buying your own system or um, leasing computer time on some cloud service. Then there is something about databases, how to work with uh, those and uh, 3D image analysis. Cloud computing is something that is a topic in general. Um, you can buy in a computer CPU hours and um, just buy for the what you need. So today's uh, outline is first a little bit motivation again, um, and uh, then some computer science principles, uh, also about um, computer system organization. Uh, then we come, well, we briefly come into the topic of big data. Um, there are even courses on that. So actually each of these topics are courses of their own um, in computer science. So. Squeezing that into two hours is uh, more like an overview entry point. If you want to go there, you have to go deeper uh, yourself later. And then the last topic is also cloud computing. So um, we have different topics or problems that we can run into. We have really big data sets um, that we want to handle and um, there could be that data set, this one single data set representing a single, single process or a single uh, population that you want to investigate. Could also be that you have many data sets of different individuals which are not really connected to each other, but sometimes it could be actually two. And then also, of course, you have exploratory studies. You have a huge pile of data and you first want to just get into it, get a feeling of what it is. So um, with the really big data sets, you have, can have several copies. You, you may need several copies in memory for doing the processing. And um, there you come into the problem that a typical tomography data set, if you have um, a two, 2K cubed, uh, it's already, uh, going towards um, 16 or even 32 uh, gigabytes. And then if you want several copies of that to process it, you easily go beyond 100, 200 gigabytes of RAM that you would in principle need to have available. Um, if you have 16, uh, many cores, of course, you can parallelize the task, but that also leaves less memory per CPU. Then you have uh, problems with um, hardware that um, you need to access all this data, dragging it up from the hard drive or even from the network. And that's also a time limiting factor. It takes time to get data from point A to point B. Uh, in data communication classes, you have as a classic comparison. Uh, when is it faster to fill a truck with hard drives and drive it to a destination than taking it over the network. So it actually takes a lot of time to, uh, to transfer data. Um, and also you need some kind of redundancy or at least stop points uh, where you can check if your analysis crash, it's software, it can crash, uh, or it's uh, overloading the operating system and then you at least should have some kind of um, insurance that 
you don't have to redo everything and maybe come to this crashing point again and crash again. Um, then we have um, many data sets that would be if you have, for example, uh, genome st uh, scale studies and you have to analyze a lot of samples in a sim similar way. Uh, it could also be dynamic experiments. So you have time series, maybe several uh, parallel time series that you want to compare and so on. So you, you can have very many data sets of the sim similar kind. And from that, you want to, at the end, extract some um, few numbers, actually. So probably you can have a reduction from gigabytes, terabytes of data into six points in a plot or something like that to be very extreme. Uh, in the exploratory studies, you're not really sure what you're looking for. You know, this sample behaves in a way, but you're not really sure why it behaves this way. So the first view, so this is actually also um, kind of an, an observer, uh, observing experiment, just looking into it. You know it behaves, but now you want to get an idea to build up your new um, base of hypothesis that you can test more specifically uh, with a control experiment. And also here, you will have a lot of data, probably a jungle that you have to somehow dig through. And um, well, then it's also a problem to get through the data in a reasonable way, in also in reasonable time. So here is one example. We have um, full animal um, phenotyping. Uh, we have a full adult animal, a fish, and um, a thousand of samples of that. They are imaged at 0 0.74 micron resolution. So each image is 11K by almost 3K by you know, only 1K. And that means we have 20 to 40 gigavoxels per sample. And each image looks something like, uh, let's see if it runs now. Come on. It should run. Now, come on. OK, there should be a nice movie going through the slices. It worked yesterday. Uh, no way. OK, wasn't meant to show today, apparently. But you can see, you can see the anatomy of, um, of the fish, of the slices, walking through um, this uh, object. Uh, here, we want to identify single cells, so we can't do any downsampling. Um, also see how cell networks are connected. Um, further on, we even want to classify the cell type and um, also do some registration uh, based on the histology. Um, another one is looking at the brain and the brain project. Again, we are talking about one micron resolution. And uh, now we have just as one cubic centimeter, so it's not that big. Uh, but still, we have uh, a thousand gigavoxels per sample in this one. So it's also a lot. Um, again, we have to do some kind of registrations between scans. We want to look at blood vessel structure and how they're networked. And um, to make it even more fun, um, adding some uh, fMRI or histology to this data. So it's actually, again, a lot of data to handle and work with in a reasonable way. And now we go on. We have, during this course, learned a lot of methods, how to work with stuff. And uh, typically, the workflow would be I need to filter using maybe a medium filter, um, some neighborhood. And uh, then we set a threshold given by something. In this case, it's just a fixed threshold, but it could be uh, that you use uh, some thresholding algorithm. This gives us then black and white regions that we want to label. Um, if they are separated, we can use the BV label. Otherwise, we may use uh, also watershedding, which requires a little bit more preparation. And um, then we want to see how large each object is. So we compute the histogram um, and see 
see the volumes and this result is something we want to save as a text file. So this looks like a realistic workflow. Um, the Python code would probably look something like this. So this works fine for a single experiment, but um, what if you want to sh make changes? So for example, you want to compare what happens to the, um, to the result if you use a Gaussian filter instead of medium filter. Uh, maybe you want to look at 3D instead of 2D images, or you can do analysis on many data. How do you approach it then? Then you need some kind of framework that is able to, to um, drill down in each folder and look at the images in each folder and produce the data. So that means you have to have some kind of managing code and then you have the analysis code. And then all of a sudden you're getting into a, a processing framework that you need to somehow work up. And you don't want to rewrite this processing workflow every time. So you have to do something more or less smarter so you can have modules, for example, of different ways. And if you start writing the code in the wrong way, so you really is, are too nested, um, then it's very hard to change things, uh, in particular if you go towards the big data and many folders and many, many di different data and a lot of parameters to work with or different options. So when you know from the beginning that this little code, I'm analysis code I'm working on, is going to be used on a larger data set, then you should also think about in the beginning already from the beginning, have it in mind, how can I make it flexible enough, but still being creative? Uh, that's, that's a balance actually uh, that you have to think about, but it's important to think about being flexible for larger, um, for repeating the same analysis on different data sets. And that also um, helps you to handle the big data and also improves the repro reproducibility. So one thing you really need when you go to um, handling the larger data set is computer science. There's no way around it. And um, normally when you start coding, you're thinking single processor and um, well, that's fine for the single example, but as soon as you go into larger images, larger data sets, multiple images, then you have to start thinking about, can I introduce parallelism? You probably all have heard about your CPU has so and so many cores. Typically today you have between four and, I don't know, 16 cores in, in a normal workstation. Uh, there are more, uh, laptop is more on the four side and the workstation is more on the 16 side and a large workstation, it may even have many, many more cores, like, um, I don't know, uh, 64 or 128 cores that you can work with. And that's pretty powerful. Um, but to handle this, you need to have, or already think a little bit about how you should implement your code. And there are different levels of doing this. You can do it on the low, low code level. So you go into, you really go into the algorithms. This is a place where I don't think you should go in the first place <laughs> because it's a really time consuming thing. And mostly people have done this kind of optimization already. And um, that means there are libraries on a higher level that where you can say, okay, I want to run this in parallel and then just parameterize it a little bit and say, okay, do it in parallel and it happens. Um, and then the next step is going on uh, to higher level. So going into distributed uh, computing, then you are leaving your own computer and go to several many other computers. And then you come into something like you can see in my background, um, a computing server room uh, with a lot of computers standing around. Sometimes it's even um, geographically distributed. So there is one computing center, maybe like the one in uh, Ticino, and then there is one at uh, uh, Amazon. I don't know, I think they are building one in Sweden right now. They have a couple in the US and, and so on. 
Um, and um, go into those big centers. And then you have to think a little bit about how you uh, build up your code or your actually your analysis manager. Um, the, the little code is probably not changing so much, but your analysis manager must be adapted to, to handling this. So this is a very big topic. I mean, everything you see in this little item list is a course of itself. So it's really a big thing in computer science to, uh, to really be able to handle all these things. Uh, so first thing is, what is parallelism? In principle, it is that you can divide a task into separate pieces, and these pieces can be executed at the same time without any problem. So a very daily life example, uh, you have the task, you have to walk for five minutes and you have to talk on the phone for five minutes. If you execute these in serial, in a series, like we did back in the 80s, 90s, um, then you first, you walk five minutes and then you talk five minutes. Today, with the multi-core processors, you can actually do this in parallel, and then you can do the same thing in half the time. This is a truth with modification, because usually you stand still when you dial your number, and then you start walking and talking. So there is a little overhead time to start up. But in general, you can say that there is a, a factor two time gain by doing these two things at the same time. Um, distributed computing is very similar to what you have when you do parallel computing, but it's more specific because um, parallel means just that you can run things at, in, at the same time. But the distributed means that it's not on the same CPU. Um, there are motherboards with several CPUs on them. Uh, it's not even certain that it's on the same machine or in the same room. So then you start adding more and more um, communication uh, issues, like um, there are network delays. It takes some time to come from one computer to the other. Uh, also file system. If you are working on a large parallel system and all computers are going on to the same data server, who is grabbing uh, the file and who has, has the right to use it at that moment? On top of that, you're not the only person on that distributed system. So there are many other users also, and that can also give you um, unbalanced load on the different nodes. And that can also give you some problems afterwards. Some examples of how distributed computing are working um, in a daily life comparison. So you have 10 friends and together, they know all the capital cities in the world. So if you want to know the capital of a single country, you just yell out to this um, bunch of friends, uh, yell out the country, and you just wait until someone brings back an answer. Maybe two gives an answer, maybe three, but the third one gives an uncertain answer. So who should you trust? That's also a little of a problem um, also, another one uh, is you want to know how know how who knows the the most countries. Again, you send out the general uh, question: Who knows um, how many countries do you know? And then you select the highest. That means you have to wait for everybody to answer, and then you just select the the highest uh, number, and then you got response. Um, another example is each friend has some money with them. And to find out how the total amount of money, you can tell each person to tell how much money they have, and you can add it together afterwards. This is also a pretty good parallel task because, again, you do a broadcast, you yell out, and then you get some numbers back. But in the end, you have this summing up 
a task that you have to sum up, but that's a rather small administration compared to the other things that are done. Um, one task that is not good is to find the median value of each coin, because then you have to ask everybody to tell which coins they have, and then you can compute the median value. Uh, this is less efficient, and um, that's a hard one. Uh, so it's not really a parallel task. What you can do is, however, there are algorithms that um, work better uh, when you sort the data if it's already pre-sorted and that makes it much easier for the algorithms to to handle it so you can tell everybody to sort your coins and send them back to me then you have already some parallel gain then there are a lot of problems i already touched it a little bit that uh, with parallel and distributed tasks each of the course, they want to access the same resources at the same time. It can be memory, it can also be files, or it can be some piece of information, it can also be a network resource uh, of some kind, um, maybe a printer. I don't think all, you, you, I don't think you do really um, parallel printing, but anyway, it could be a device which is very slow. And um, this is really a problem and also, you can see the effect of memory access in, in the efficiency of parallel code. And um, what you have to do to make sure that you have atomic operations, meaning you are sure that it's only one who manipulates the data before the next one can take it. There are different uh, mechanisms in the programming languages. And this is actually a level that you will not see directly, but you should be aware of that problem are there. Um, this kind of stuff you only get into when you do the low level optimization of the coding. But anyway, you can see the effects of it and uh, you should also know that uh, if you have a breakdown in performance, it's probably because of that the resource, that there are conflicts about accessing the resources. And this goes down to different levels. So you even already have the problem if you are talking about the cache memory, not even the main memory of the RAM, but also in the cache memory, you can see these effects. And what is built up is that you have these guarded sections. So there is something called um, uh, semaphores and mutexes. And they say, okay, if I go into this section, I lift uh, the semaphore, and I do my stuff and then I um, release it again. Now we come to something called deadlocks. If there are several processes and you have done applied um, semaphores on different places in the wrong way, you can get into a race condition. And uh, a classic uh, example mentioned in computer science is the dining philosopher, philosopher's problem, where you have uh, five philosophers around the table you have five forks, and this is a dish that requires you use two forks. But as you can see, there are not enough fork to, forks that everybody can use the forks, uh, two forks at the same time. So the first uh, attempt is everybody takes the fork to the left. Hmm. Then they can't eat. And I have to put them back. Then you have to somehow come up with a rule to make sure that everybody can eat at least at some point. And this is the problem that you have to solve uh, in to get around the racing conditions. And um, in the worst case, everybody is just sitting there holding their own fork. I have the right to have the fork and never releases it. And the CPU goes wild, but nothing happens. So. Uh, this is also a thing that you have to look out for when you start with um, doing parallel processing. Um, on the higher level, other people have done this thinking for you, so you don't have to really think about it so much. But anyway, it's good to know about that you have a dead, could have a deadlock situation. Um, so 
when you do the parallel processing, you have some challenges. Uh, one is um, coordination. So you have all these guarded regions and you have to really make sure that everybody gets the resources they need at the right point. And some tasks are trivially parallelizable, then it's easy, then you just split up the data and everybody are running in parallel, fine. Other algorithms, they are more nested and it's maybe you have processes for different tasks and uh, each task does something and then it's something else. Um, and then it's more tricky to coordinate who is doing what and when. Um, I also mentioned already about the mutability that um, two or more cores or computers are trying to write the same information and then it's no longer deterministic what you actually get in the memory cell. And uh, yeah, and then we have the problems of blocking that they are waiting uh, on resources and never get to the right spot. Uh, you can really see in the performance curves or in the, in the um, CPU utilization that, oh, there is a bad spot. It's not going soundly in that. Um, if you're playing the game of optimizing code on low level. So what can happen is um, the parallel speed up you want to expect is really that you have a linear speed up, you have a number of cores, and ideally you would have something like a straight line, a one-to-one -one, um, relation that if you add a core, then it's really directly going a speed up with the factor of the number of cores. But in reality, you get something like this. So there is some overhead, just starting a thread costs you something. So it's not really so easy that you can just divide the execution time of the single thread by the number of cores. So usually it's something like this. It's still linear to a certain point. Then it starts breaking down and all of a sudden it's even going slower. And there are cases when you can come into the, um, that it takes more time for the computer to work on eight or 16 cores than it takes on a single core. The computer, it's glowing and you can hear the fan ventilating, but you're slower. And this is actually a thing about uh, cash problems, uh, racing conditions and all that. So be aware that it's not just that adding more and more cores will do the stuff for you. Um, then when we come to distributed computing, there is a lot of um, problems that are same as for parallel computing, but there are a couple of more um, issues. So one is sending instructions and or data away to some, some other place. It takes some time. I already hinted on fault tolerance when I talked about uh, people telling about the countries that it could be that most deliver the right answer, but it could be that some is for some reason, uh, maybe it has the wrong data to work with, or maybe it's just that it's failing, that's it's falling out. So you need to in, build in into these big systems, you need to build in some fault tolerance, maybe that you need uh, to have the reply from two computers, um, two nodes, um, before you can make the decision or something like that. Also, data storage is a problem, if, and particularly if you have um, wide distributed systems. Um, where do you put the data? Do you put it centrally? Then it takes a long time to grab it. Or do you kind of send out a task together with the data and then tell it, tell the distributed node, okay, this is what you are going to work with. Bring me back the answers. Uh, so that are different ways to handle it. It depends on how large the data set is, but the more data you have to work with, 
intimately. Uh, that requires also that the data is closer. So um, if you only have to grab a one point here, one point there, of course you can do it on the centralized storage. But as soon as you, for example, will work intensely on say some gigabytes of images, then it's better to copy the data first and then locally work on it. That you can also see probably in your own uh, projects. If you have a uh, group storage uh, where you put all your measured data and when you start working on it, you, you notice that, oh, it takes ages to load the images into the, to the data, uh, to the uh, processing code. Then it's mostly easier if you just copy it from your server onto your local computer and then it's 10 times faster because uh, there is a huge difference in transferring things over a gigabit network compared to a modern uh, SSD drive. So you can notice these effects also in your daily life actually. To program for parallel computing, there are different approaches. You can work on the two um, paradigms. One is the imperative, which is what you normally do uh, when you write uh, in pro the traditional programming languages, uh, C, C++, Java, Python, etc., where you have exact orders what you want to do step by step, and uh, the management of the data is manually controlled. Um, also, the job and task execution is manual, and there is pretty good um, potential to tweak and optimize the performance in this context. So coming back to the soup that I introduced in lecture one, we have first, we go to the market, buy what we want in the vegetables section, then we go to the butcher, buy some meat, and when we come home, then we start chopping the carrots and potatoes in pieces. Then we start heating the water, wait until the water is boiling and then add in the vegetables and wait a little bit and then we add the meat. And then we get some kind of soup. So it's really step by step easily. The other way is to work declarative. So instead of giving the task, um, task what you have to do, you rather turn it the other way around, that you say you want to achieve this and that. So what you do is you define a couple of tasks. So in this case, uh, you define the task chop uh, veggies, um, and the other one is chop meat, and then you come to a point oops, where you, uh, so there it is. So you have the, the veggies, you have the meat, uh, then you have a waiting point. Wait until these are happened. So this is a wait. And from that point, um, you can start doing something else. You can start two new processes. So this would be the chopping uh, of potatoes chop potatoes, chop uh, carrots, and uh, then you can, in parallel, you can even start a new process, boiling water, and um, then you have to wait for that one. Uh, actually, all three of them. So you have to wait for that one, and that one, and that one. And finally, you can also add the meat. So you can see that there are some waiting points and um, in principle this these points are the ones that control the flow not that you're doing them um now how can we use these two approaches in parallel systems uh, in the imperative case you can tell many peoples that now you go and buy the carrots and the vegetables uh, in general uh, at the market. Uh, now you all go to uh, um, buy the meat, but usually it's sufficient that only one person is doing it. So you send out one person to do um, uh, the buying. 
then you can actually, this is a time consuming task. So you could do, for example, that you do the buying. Oops. Uh, then you come till the chopping and that you can split out doing on many. So many can do the chopping. Um, and then you need to buy, uh, boil the water. Um, and um, after that, you can add everything in. So there are some tasks you can split out and other ones that you just have to do in a single. Um, here, instead, you I already uh, draw the gra graph before. Here, you can instead say, OK, chop veggies is one task. You send one guy to do that. Chop meat, you send another guy to do that. Um, then when we come into um, chopping the vegetables, cannot, of course, you can split several um, instances of chopping carrots on chopping potatoes that you can do. Uh, heating water is a separate task and um, all of those need to wait until the barrier is uh, um, reached. And uh, well, then you have done that stuff. Um, so there are different approaches how you actually work with it. And uh, mostly imperative soap requires more control of the software implementation. The declarative uh, approach, you can send these tasks to a system and the system is scheduling when it's done. It makes it easier to work with in that sense. Um, yeah, so this is just um, an overview of the results, more or less everything I told right now. But there is this uh, end thing here about the lazy evaluation. So we had this uh, schedule that I were draw drawing with the um, uh, with the declarative um, approach, and finally you have your soup. Then you can do it the other way around. You you. Uh, don't call the processes on before they are needed. And then you more or less do an, instead of starting up here, you start here and go in this direction. So you, you know you want to have a soup, okay. Then you can start the processes that are needed to do this. And then you can see, okay, to do the other ones, you actually need to start this process and this process. And then you can go back getting those done. And finally you come to the point that everything is done. Um, this has also some resource optimization benefits. So it's usually um, a good approach to work with. You can also see it in, um, let's see. No, right now I don't have a good example. Um, but anyway, it's, it's, it's actually a good way of working. Um, you don't allocate resources before you need them. The same thing is uh, when you when you are working with um, with data. If you um, do some evaluation on some data, you can also say that you don't have to copy the memory until it's really needed to be copied. So if you have, for example, um, an image, um, you need a second image and they are used in parallel a while with the same data. And all of a sudden you need to modify this one. Then at this point, you copy it to a new memory. And then you continue with two separate copies. But before that, you are in the same memory. And here you start working in two memory pieces. So this is also a way of lazy copying, lazy evaluation. So it's, um, it's commonly used actually in in different software. You don't see it, but it happens. Um, then the next thing is uh, going into the organization of um, how to work with a lot of data. And I think this is probably a good point to make a break. Um, let's take um, 10 minutes break and be back again five past um, 10 and uh, see you soon.